Hebrews chapter number 12. We're going to begin reading in verse number 6 this morning. <clears throat> the Bible says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Now, in this passage, the writer of the book of Hebrews <clears throat> begins the chapter talking about very oft quoted verse saying, wherefore seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Okay, let us lay aside every weight which does so easily beset us. Verse number two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We know those verses. But verses one and two are meant so that we can embrace the verses that come later. He says, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Then verses 3, 4, and 5 talk about how Jesus endured the burden of the cross for your benefit. Then we get to verse number 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Now keep in mind, verse number 1. He says, saying that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness. Talking about first, God the Father, Christ, the Holy Ghost, then all those saints that are already in glory, those around us, are we not written epistles, don't and read of all men? There are so many witnesses that are looking at your life that it's worth doing it the right way. Right? No man liveth unto himself, no man dieth unto himself. Okay, but, he says, because there's so many people watching us, not just those that we can see, those that we cannot see, because there's a record being taken, let us lay aside the weight. Let us lay aside the sin which do what easily beset us and run this race with patience. It says, let's do it right. It's not a drag race. It's not a quarter of a mile away and you've got to give it everything that you got for, well, if you're a funny car, about six seconds, right? If you're top fuel, about 3.5. Okay, that's not how we do races. Okay, it's also not one of them goofy, except, I got a guy at work. His name's Scott. A real good guy. Scott's not right in the head. Because Scott goes and he runs races. He ran a 200-mile race through the desert. Okay? He's like one of them extreme running people. Because he was like, yeah, you know, after all that, you know, a few of my toenails when I got back fell off. I'm like, that's not normal, Scott. Your body is trying to tell you that that is not good. And he's like, oh, I'll just train harder and then everything will be worth it. And I'm like, what? No, bad. Bad. I run when I need to run. You know how often it is? Never right now. Okay? <laughs> and then all I need to do is outrun the slowest person. Okay? If you're the second slowest, that still means you're fast enough to get away. Right? But I still think I can take most of y'all. Okay? But the point is that we lay aside those things which we know are a hindrance towards us. Then he goes on to verse number 2, looking unto Jesus. There's your inspiration. There's your model. There's the one that did it perfectly in the will of God. Why wouldn't we look to the witness that Christ left for us in the Word and in His Spirit, His Spirit bears witness with our spirit, reaffirming that what is in the Word is true. And how did He do it? He embraced the burden, not because the burden was enjoyable, not because it's what he needed but because it's what was best for you and I we embrace the burden of living a Christian life 
not because it's the most enjoyable thing, but one, for the joy which is set before us, and two, we understand that by laying aside our will and by laying aside those things which we would desire in the carnal man, we instead elevate the name of Christ and take up his cause. He laid aside what he had so that we might gain, so we lay aside what we were so that we can become what he purchased for us. Okay, well, now down to verse number six. Part of that burden, right? The reason that we need to look to Jesus. You think the Garden of Gethsemane was enjoyable for Christ? No, his very flesh was hemorrhaging. It was tearing itself apart under the stress and the burden that it was the will of the Father for him to bear. Well, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Ooh, that's a bad word. Now, people don't like hearing that word. We think chasten, and we think, oh, that's punishment. Sometimes, but not always. Chastening, okay, literally means that God's trying to chase you back to where you should be. Chastening is a corrective measure. It is for your betterment. We'll get to that here in a minute. But we think that chastening is the wrath of God being poured out on your life. No, if God wanted to really pour His wrath out on your life, you'd cease to exist. Go see examples A and B, Sodom and Gomorrah. After the wrath of God was poured out on them, nobody could find them no more. they has gone, consumed. Right? God does not chasten you because He is angry at you. God chastens you because He loves you. Let's continue. It says, And He scourgeth every son whom He receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, and your bastards are not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in sub subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he, for our profit, that we might be partakers of His holiness. Why does the Father chasten us? Because the Father expects the Son to be like Him. He gives the analogy. Why did your earthly fathers chasten you? So that you wouldn't grow up and act like heathens. It says, verse number 9, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Then verse number 10, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. Sometimes, chastening is not because you did anything wrong, but it's just because the person chasing you has a preference on how you ought to behave. Okay, well, how do you know that, Brother Jordan? Because I was chastened into behaving a certain way. And other people's parents clearly did not chasten them to behave in the same manner. Some things are preferential. Right? We are creatures of preferences. Okay, You all know, Diet Mountain Dew, best soft drink in the world, according to Brother Jordan. Brother Bob's shaking his head because he has a different preference. Okay, In truth, the best drink ever created was sweet tea, but because I put too much sugar in it, I was afraid I was going to get diabetes, so I had to find one without sugar, hence Diet Mountain Dew. Okay? I made the trade, Brother Aaron, that if I cut sugar out of my drinks, I didn't have to cut it out of my food, and that was a sacrifice I was willing to make. But in my head, that math works, okay? But, but we have preferences. One father may chasten his son to his pleasure. This is what I believe you ought to be. Another father may chasten his son to a different standard. Well, with God... There is no preferential treatment. But there is no respect to persons with God. What's God's standard? Christ. He chastens us all to the same standard. But the writer of Hebrews says, if we had fathers down here that chastened us for their pleasure, up to their standard, yet we showed them reverence, how much more should we show reverence to Jehovah God that chastens us not for His preference but for your profit it's for your betterment 
Verse number 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. If you don't care about somebody, you don't care how they behave. If you don't love somebody, it doesn't bother you if they go out and act like a fool. If they go out and live like a heathen. Because they don't have any meaning to you. You chasten those that you care about because you care about how they're going to turn out. You don't chasten someone for today. You chasten them for the rest of their life. The chastening is done today, but not so that they behave today. Not so that you prune a certain action out of their life. You chasten them today so that tomorrow they're better equipped to live life on their own. So that you don't have to monitor them. Does not the Bible say if you train up a child in the way he should go when he's old, he shall not depart from it? The same is true spiritually. If God chastens you into the correct path as a young Christian, when you're old, he's not going to have to chasten you again. Because it's going to be a part of you. It's for your betterment. Eventually, a child begins to understand that mom and dad just don't hate them. Okay? The reason that they are being spanked or the reason that they get yanked up out of the pew in church and dragged outside, right, and cause the scene, it's not because mom and dad hate them, it's because mom and dad love them. But that's not the right way to act. That's not the right thing to do. And then eventually, chastening becomes less severe. Okay, you've heard our pastor tell this story. Sydney's here. She can bear witness to this. Okay. This one didn't get whooped too much. Because this one caught on real quick. Oh, as long as I don't do the things that they tell me not to do, I'm not going to get in trouble. Okay. My hard-headed brother had to have the devil beat out of him a few times. He didn't understand that what he wanted wasn't correct. Okay, so until he learned that, guess what? Whoopings. Okay, the whooping was not meant to hurt him. It was meant to break his will. Right, was his butt sore? Yeah, but he got over it. Okay, you ever had a bee sting? You think it's the worst thing in the world when it first happens and then what? Ah, it wasn't that bad. Unless you're allergic to bees, then it, then it could be bad. Nobody in here is allergic to whoopings. You know why you don't like whoopings? Because whoopings showed you that you were wrong. The reason that you remember those whoopings from when you were a kid, it's not because the pain was so severe, it's because the lesson that the whooping taught you was so important you remembered it. God's chastening is no different. God knows His children. They're His. Right? Chastening is specific to a person. God knows how to get your attention. God knows how to correct you. God knew just how to show you that you were a sinner before He saved you. So why do you think that after you get saved, He doesn't know just how to show you what needs to change in your life? But there are degrees of chastening. Right? First, there's correction. What's correction? Well, you know that the Bible talks about how a shepherd has a staff, and then the shepherd also had that hook. Okay, the hook had the hook in it so that he could grab a sheep by the neck and pull him back to where he needed to be. That's correction. Some people take the correction. Other people don't. After correction... There's rebuke. What's rebu rebuke is a confrontation. Hey, what you're doing is wrong. We tried to correct it, but you didn't, so now we've got to deal with it, call it out on the carpet, and say, if you keep going the way you're going, there's going to be consequences. Okay? Preaching is a form of rebuke. Right? Teaching imparts knowledge. Preaching requires a decision. Every rebuke requires you to decide what you're going to do with that information. Either you say, yes, Lord, and you fall in line. Guess what? After the rebuke, there's no chastisement because you've corrected it. 
But see, if we ignore rebuke, then what happens? Chastisement. Sometimes chastisement is a smack on the wrist. Other times chastisement is God go cut a switch and he's got to lay into you. Not because he hates you, but because he needs to get a hold of your attention and break your will. Chastisement, verse number, uh, I already lost it. Verse number 11. Now no chastising for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. In the moment you think the chastisement is the worst thing in the world. It's grievous unto you. Why? Because you're still looking at it from your perspective, not God's perspective. Chastisement is by nature designed to stop something, nip it in the bud. If you ignore chastisement, then anything past that, right? You're a rebel, you're a renegade. God has clearly shown to you in no uncertain terms that what you're doing is not right, but yet you continue to do it. That's rebellion. What is rebellion? Well, the Bible teaches us that rebellion is, is the sin of witchcraft. What is witchcraft? Denouncing everything that is holy and embracing the unholy. Looking to the world and looking to things that fell from heaven for spiritual guidance and for spiritual empowerment. That's witchcraft. Well, what's rebellion? Well, if you rebel against God, you're rejecting God and embracing everything about your carnal self. Sounds a whole lot like witchcraft. God doesn't know what he's talking about. That's what the devil said too. That's that spirit of antichrist that the Bible talks about. It's rebelling against the one that God said was the standard, Christ. When we reject chastisement, we become rebels. But if you humble yourself after chastisement, then you realize the rest of verse number 11, nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. The, pur the purpose of chastisement is righteousness. Why does God correct you? Because He wants you to be righteous, not unrighteous. Why does God rebuke you? Because He wants you to, you know, with in no uncertain terms, understand what holiness and unholiness is. He confronts you with, this is what holiness is, and this is where you're at. You need to get back to holiness. And chastisement is to stop a behavior. Why? Because it is unholy and unrighteous. After chastisement, if you embrace it, and you admit, yes, Lord, I was wrong, you repent, then chastisement transforms into righteousness. Because chastisement is not a battle of who's stronger, you or God. God wins that every day of the week. God always wins. Chastisement is not a theological discussion between you and God on what is or what is not holy. He knows what holiness is because He is holy. And everything else outside of God is not holy. He wins that argument. Chastisement is not a battle of wills on who can hold out longer. But I promise you this, Jonah thought that he could hold out a whole lot longer than God. Three days in the belly of a great fish, he thought he was in hell and he was willing to do anything that God wanted him to do. Right? Your will is going to cave long before God's will does. Because nothing that is still exists without the will of God. By Him and through Him do all things consist. He made it all and He keeps it all. Your will isn't going to be able to overpower or outlast God's will. So then what is chastisement? Chastisement is an experience that you can't get away from. You can run from it, but it, you can't get rid of it. It's attached to you at the hip. God's chastisement is unavoidable, not because, again, 
God is angry with you, but because God loves you. If you had a gift for someone, and you knew that it was exactly what they needed, and you thought that you were going to meet them at a certain place, you wouldn't rest until you eventually got that gift into that person's hands. Because they need it, because you desire to give it to them, and because you know it's what they need. If they call and say, well, I can't make it, well, that's fine, I'll come to you. Or I had something come up, that's fine, I'll stop by and I'll just drop it off for you. You're going to make sure that they get that gift. But God knows what comes after chastisement. What is it? It's the fruit of righteousness. God knows that you need righteousness in your life if you want to live as a victorious Christian. God knows that outside of righteousness, you have no hope as a Christian. If it was dependent on your righteousness, we'd all be doomed. That's why he robed us in his righteousness. He knows that you can't be an ambassador for Christ. He knows that you can't live as a son of God. He knows that you can't embrace the fruits of the Spirit if you reject righteousness. He knows that you need righteousness. So when you do wrong, when we err, if we don't listen to correction, if we don't listen to rebuke, then God's going to make sure that you get that gift called chastisement. Because He knows that you need it. If God hated you when you were out of sight, you'd be out of mind. In fact, if you're without chastisement, we've already read it, you're a bastard and not a son. If you're not one of God's, He doesn't care how you act. But if you are one of God's, He knows you need righteousness. Not just for His name's sake, but for your sake. You really think that once God buys you that the devil's going to be satisfied with you just sitting on the bench? No, he wants your utter destruction. And if you reject God's righteousness, guess what you're relying on? Your own abilities to keep you in the power of God, in the protection of God, in the will of God. You're not going to do that. Arm of flesh is going to fail you. God knows that the only way for his children to overcome the world is not through themselves, but greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Yea, we are more than conquerors through Christ. Why? Because it's not us. It's Christ doing the conquering. How do we receive all the benefits, all the blessings, all the grace, all the mercies of God? It's not because of what you do or how you do it. It's because you've been conformed to the image of His Son. And when God looks at you, He sees His Son, and He does for you because of what Christ did for us in verses 1 through 5. So if the only reason that we have the unmerited favor of God is because of what Christ did, why do you think that God's going to be impressed with what we can do afterwards? God's not going to be impressed with your five-step plan on how you're going to get back into the will of God. God has a real good plan for that. It's called repent. Turn from what you're doing and get back to where you're supposed to be. Well, how are we supposed to get back? No, don't worry about that. God's got a real good guide. His name's the Holy Ghost. He leads and guides us into all truth. God's got the map. He's already know, he knows every step that you would take before you ever were born, let alone before you took it. God knew exactly where you were going to be and how to get you back to where you need to be. Rebuke is all about saying you're wrong. Correction is trying to show you that God knows right. Chastisement is proving to you that you are wrong and that God is right. If we had a childlike faith, chastisement would be a whole lot less frequent in our lives, Brother Randy. A child, before they start getting ornery, if you tell a child that that over there is bad, they're going to stay away from it. Unless they're like Brother Jordan, in which case, well, why is it bad? I believe that it's bad, I just want to know why it's bad. Well, it's going to hurt you, but why would it hurt me? Well, it doesn't want to hurt you. It's just that it's going to. Well, that doesn't make sense. Shut up. Go do something. Go watch Batman on TV again. Okay. 
But a childlike faith, that's bad. Okay. That's bad. They avoid it. They don't do it. A childlike faith, hey, stop. Hold my hand before we cross the street. No, no second thought. Okay. Here's my hand. Walk me across the street. Okay, I've used this analogy before. But when it comes to correction and rebuke, the steps before chastisement, to this day, I can hear my... Every now and then, Dad will snap when he's preaching out of nowhere, and like I'll kind of jerk like an eyebrow goes up. I'm like, hang on, I know that sound. You know why? Because back in the day, when we was in church, if I was acting up, a snap is all that I got. That was the one warning. Right? I could hear a crack like a whip or a gunshot. I knew if I heard a snap, I knew Dad snap, and I knew other people snaps. If Dad snapped, I knew, oh, I'm on thin ice. I got to stop doing whatever it is that I'm doing. To this day, I can hear him snap from four counties away. What was that? That was correction. That was rebuke. A whole lot didn't have to be said. I knew, oh, I got to straighten up. Right? But chastisement wasn't something that happened around you. It wasn't something that was told to you. Chastisement is something that you cannot get out of. You can't say, well, can you whip that one first? No, that one wasn't Dad's kid. I was. Right? Well, can we, can we finish this first? No, it needs to happen now. Well, can we explain why it was wrong? No, it's just wrong. Chastisement is about proving to you that God was right. You know why that's an unenjoyable, why it seems to be grievous for the present time? Because you've got to admit that you were wrong, and you've got to knock yourself off of that pedestal that you put you on and get humble again. That's why it's grievous. If we were quick to admit to God that, Lord, you're right and I'm wrong, there would be a whole lot less chastisement. If we were quick to understand, Lord, thank you for that correction, I didn't know that. I'm going to apply that, and I'm going to be on the lookout for it next time. And if there's something else coming along that I don't know, correct me again. Right? If, in ignorance, we go outside of correction, we enter into rebuke, it would pain us. It would cause us emotional distress to understand that what we've been doing hadn't lived up to God's expectation. I, I, I was the one that if you told me that you disappointed him, that hurt worse than any belt ever could. Right? To know that you had fallen short of what was expected of you. That because God loves you, He expects much from you. And that you didn't live up to the expectation. That would humble us if we weren't full of pride and if we weren't full of self. Right? Rebuke and correction would be a whole lot more common if we would just admit that God was right. But because we are prideful, because we are full of self, because we're hard-headed, because we think that we've got things figured out, we've charted a course, and if we keep going down it, there's coming a day. We don't know when it'll be. Because if we knew it was coming, we'd avoid it. We'd do everything that we could to outrun it. Again, See, example, Jonah. God told him to go to Nineveh. Where to go? The exact opposite direction, down to Tarshish. If we knew it was coming, we'd try every which way to avoid it, but there's coming a day, if you keep going down that path, that chastisement's coming. We think of chastisement as a bad thing, but chastisement is a blessing. Okay, verse number 11 already talked about it. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You know how you become more righteous? Through chastening. Now, I've already said there's degrees to chastening. But without correction, you cannot become more like the image of Christ. 
without God taking more of the world out of you and replacing it with himself, how will you become more Christ-like? Unless God digs up the roots in the soil of your heart, how are the fruits of the Spirit meant to take root and to bloom and to become more prosperous in your life? The potter doesn't put his hands on the clay for no good reason. If the clay was able to turn itself into whatever shape it needed to be in, the potter wouldn't have to get his hands dirty. No, the potter has to apply himself to the clay to form the clay into what it should be. Okay, look back at verse number 6. It says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Chastening is for the purpose of scourging. Now that word scourging, again, has negative connotations because when we think of scourge, we think of what they did to Jesus in the Hall of Praetorium where Pilate delivered him over to the Roman centurions to scourge him. Okay, scourge, just simply, okay, scourge means to test, to try, or in other words, find out what something's made of. Sometimes scourging can be very invasive. Okay, if you want to find out what's on the inside of a computer, you've got to dismantle the whole outside of the computer. Okay, sometimes scourging, you've got to take everything down to its base pieces in order to understand what it's made of. Other times, it may be less invasive. Okay, I'm told. I don't know because farmer's markets and everything else not within my daily life cycle. But my grandpa tells me that back when they was kids, Every now and then they'd go up and they'd take a plug out of a watermelon, take a bite, and then put the plug back so nobody would know. They said it was wrong. He told us that his kids. He says, don't do that. It's stealing. He said, we didn't know that at the time. He said, we thought that somebody buy it and they'd get the whole rest of the watermelon. We didn't think we'd steal anything from them. Okay, but sometimes all it takes is a little sample to figure out what's on the inside. Well, it's, it's got watermelon on the inside. All right, put the sample back. Okay, they do things when they're studying trees and everything, they'll take a core sample. It's where they drill into the center of the tree and they take it out and they count how many rings are there to figure out how old it is. In the grand scheme of things, that's a very small part of the tree that was taken out. The tree's going to live. It's going to be okay. Okay, sometimes you just got to put a tap into the side of the tree to find out it's got sap inside of it. If that's all you wanted to know, that's where the scourging ends. But see, the scourging process, for lack of a better term, is God's breaking you down to your base parts. Why? To show you, one, what's inside yourself. Because no man knoweth his own heart. It's deceitfully wicked, no man can know it. God knows every thought, every intent, everything that you don't know about yourself, God still knows it. But God needs to, once He's purchased you, inspect the goods. You don't go to buy a car without taking it for a test drive. Well, God knew what you were when He bought you. So after He bought you, He needs to make you acceptable, one, for His use, but also acceptable so that you have a profitable life. We've already said chastisement is for your profit. That scourging process is where God takes you and says, we don't need this. We need more of this. And then he begins to not just throw it at you and say, make it work. No, he applies it to you. God never takes something without replacing it with something from himself. If God asks for it, if he chastens us to get it out of our life, why is it? Because it occupies a spot that he wants to occupy in your life. Well, the scourging process is removing those things which are undesirable. It's saying, Lord, here I am. 
take me make me into what I ought to be and then use me for your glory we all like talking about yeah when, you know living in Canaan land victorious Christian living where you know we're equipped to handle everything that could come our way you know how that happens scourging you know how you get wheat you got to beat the chaff off of it you know how you get potatoes up out of the ground you got to yank them out the ground they don't want to come out the ground they're happy in the ground you got to yank them out of the ground but we've got things in our life because of the old man that they're deep down into the soil of this flesh and God's got to get in there and yank them out if you're doing it I mean if you allow him to do it if you're cooperating the process goes a whole lot quicker Okay, I'm reminded of a story that when I was five years old and they took me to mom's office because it was time for Jordan to get shots, Jordan did not think that it was time for him to get shots. So he fought them. And at five years old, it took five nurses to hold me down so that they could give me the shot. He said, what were they feeding you? Not Wheaties, probably Pop-Tarts. But you ever try to get a child who doesn't want something to happen into a position to allow it to happen right all of a sudden you're like how in the world are they this strong because you're not trying to hurt them but they're trying to hurt you no get away from me I don't want that thing you know why it's so painful sometimes for God to do things in your life because you're fighting them instead of letting them do it you know how long the shot actually took to get just like that I didn't even know it was, I was still fighting them after the shot because I didn't know that the shot had already happened. What are you saying? The thing that we were trying to resist, it'll be over a whole lot quicker if we just allow it to happen. But because God will not force His will upon us, if you don't want to submit to the scourging, God has to convince you that the scourging is necessary. That's chastisement. And let's be honest. Okay, first off, doctors are liars. Anybody ever had a shot of Novocaine? They say, oh, it's going to feel like a bee sting. I ain't never been stung like a bee like that in my entire life. Worst bee sting that has ever existed. Okay, don't lie to me. Be honest to me. Okay, or they say, oh, this will be over real quick, and then it's never over that quick. Right, well, if this all goes right, we'll be out of here in a few minutes. I'm okay with that, because then all you got to do is say, well, something didn't go right. I'm used to that. Right? I'm weird. They went to go get me anesthesia from my wisdom teeth, and they said count backwards from 100. I don't remember 97, but they say I got into the high 80s, and they gave me a whole second bag of anesthesia. I don't remember the rest of that day. Mom said that I you know, walked around Kroger and pushed a cart for her. I don't remember that. Had surgery at like 8 a.m., woke up at 4.30, and I'm like, what happened? Right? I'm used to things not going according to plan with Brother Jordan. Okay, but if a doctor says, hey, you're getting an MRI, as long as you stay still, we'll be able to get this over on the first shot. But if you've got ADHD brain like Brother Jordan and you get in there and the music that they're playing and you start tapping your foot, hey, stop moving. Sorry, I forgot. I didn't think I was moving that much. What happens? They got to go back and take the pictures again. Now you're stuck in the hot tube that barely fits your shoulders in it anyway, and you're trying not to move, but you're afraid that if you relax, you're going to like bump up against the machine, and then when they go to pull you out, you're going to get stuck, right? Then you start thinking about all that stuff. Guess what you're not thinking about? Not moving. Then a lady says, hey, hold still. And I'm like, sorry, I was thinking about how hot it is in here, because the first one I was in that didn't have a fan, the second one there was a fan, but it was blowing like down here and not here. So it didn't really help. Well, he's saying, brother, we think about everything else in the world except what? Allowing God to do what God wants to do. If you're thinking about everything else in the world, you're not going to notice the correction where he pulls you back to the flock with the hook. And when you're rebuked, you're going to think, oh, that's a real good lesson for somebody else, God. It doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't dawn on you that what God's trying to tell you is that you are wrong because you're thinking about everything else in the world. 
And then chastisement comes along to say, no, this is you, this is where you're at, and this is where you should be. Why? So that the scourging can happen. You say, Brother Jordan, scourging doesn't sound fun. It's not fun. But God doesn't do it because He enjoys the scourging process. God does it because He enjoys what comes after it. What's that? The fruit of righteousness. Look again at the end of verse number 11. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You know what that means? In order to get the fruit of righteousness, you have to be exercised by chastisement and scourging. You know what that means? If you don't go through the process, you don't get the end result. The only way to get the peaceable fruit of righteousness in your life is to be scourged. And whether you submit to that scourging as Christ did when they crucified Him, willingly, silent as a lamb before the shears, or if God has to chastise you because you want to go kicking and screaming, the end result is the same, scourging. Whether you embrace it and accept it, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, or whether you try to buck it and fight it and God has to break you before you can be scourged, the end result is the fruit of righteousness. The only difference is how we get to scourging, either by choice, either by surrendering our will and embracing the will of the Father, or whether God has to break our will in order to get us to see that the scourging is necessary. You ever been whipped as a kid, and then for the rest of the day all you can think about is how you're angry that the person told you that you was wrong? You're in a bad mood for the rest of the day. You don't want to talk to nobody. Somebody comes up to you. <clears throat> shut up. Right? Then you get smacked for saying shut up. But I wonder how much quicker the scourging process would go instead of being belligerent and instead of saying, you know what, you were right, I was wrong. Instead of trying to go through all the possibilities that we could find a loophole that we could say, nope, I was right. Instead of fighting it, resisting it, instead of trying to justify what we had done, if you were right, God wouldn't have chastised you. But the rest of the process can't proceed until you say, Lord, you were right. Okay, now God knows that you've learned a lesson. Now the scourging can begin. Uh, the worst part of most things is the anxiety beforehand because you don't know what it's going to be. You don't know how long it's going to take. You don't know what the end result is going to be. You don't know what the news is going to be. You don't know how it's going to impact your life. And so you're sitting there beforehand and you've got all this anxiety going on in your life. And you work yourself up to where you think it's going to be the worst thing in the world, but by the time it's over you're thinking that's it. That was it? I can go now? Yeah, the scourging process, God doesn't make it drag on. He doesn't want to cause you discomfort. But He knows that the scourging needs to happen. So what's He going to try to do? Make the scourging last as little or as short as it possibly can be. Surgery would be a whole lot worse without anesthesia. What happens? You go to sleep and you wake up and it's already done. Uh, we're not stuck in the Civil War days either where, the, the, true story, they used to use ether as anesthesia and then people started exploding on operating tables. And they were like, huh, maybe we should change that. Now, God doesn't use any ether either. What's He do? He reaches out in love and He takes that thing that you finally let go of and He removes it because He knows that it's either a weight or it's a sin that easily besets you. So he has to scourge it from you for your betterment. So that you can be more righteous. So that you can live up to that expectation of holiness. But how does that happen? Through scourging. The only way you become righteous is through scourging. 
The only way that Christ was proven to be the righteous, sinless, perfect Lamb of God was because Pilate first questioned him, then they scourged him, and guess what they found in him? No fault. They had to blindfold him because they couldn't stand to look at him while they were scourging him. Because all that they saw was somebody that loved them and someone that had no fault in them. They couldn't justify in their minds why they were doing to this sinless, perfect lamb what they were doing when they could see his eyes. Well, why do you think verse number 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? If you look to Jesus and you see those eyes of love and those eyes of compassion, you understand that the scourging is not because he enjoys it, but because you need it. Yeah, it may be a little uncomfortable. There may be some discomfort in the flesh. There may be the pain of losing something that used to be attached to you. But guess what he applies? The balm of Gilead. Guess how he does it? With loving kindness as a great physician. And guess how he puts you together better than you were before. But after my back surgery, I didn't go smack the doctor every time that I went to get up out of the chair for the next couple of days, and I was in pain. Because I understood that that pain was to make me better. I did not resent the one that cut me in order to help me. When you understand that it's necessary, the pain isn't a problem. Because you know that God wouldn't have caused the pain if it wouldn't go away. That God wouldn't have crippled you, right? Or taken you to a point where you think, well, I'm never going to be what I used to be. Just wait and see. Once God puts his hand on the situation, whatever he took out, it was slowing you down. It was holding you back. And whatever it's going to be replaced with, it's going to be righteousness. But I don't go out and run any marathons. Okay, I'm not hitting the weight room and deadlifting and squatting the things that I used to do way back in the day. But guess what? I walk around without pain. What do you say, Brother Jordan? You may be less in the eyes of the world afterwards, but you'll be able to do a whole lot more for the cause of Christ, even though the world may say, no, you've lost something. No, I've gained a whole lot more. The scourging process is holding you up to Christ and seeing what doesn't match. It's taking that part of you that isn't like Christ and removing it so that Christ can move in more into your life. See, scourging isn't something that can be done without pain. See, all those things that we think, right, don't buy into Joel Osteen or any of the self-help books or the 12-step program, if something is a part of you, you can't let it go. It's a part of you. If you'd walk up, okay, don't do this, but if you would walk up and put a post-it note on my arm and then staple it to my arm, that's now a part of me. You know the only way to get it not a part of me is to cause more pain. Because I can't let go of a staple. Right? If you were to stitch something to an, you know, one piece of fabric to another piece of fabric, they're attached now. Those two pieces of fabric can't wave themselves fast enough that they're going to become separated. The stitch has to be cut. Well, what's that stitch that's a part of our flesh? What's that staple that holds things to us? That's the old man trying to retain and hold on to those things which it likes. You know how sin became a part of flesh? Man had to die. When Adam and Eve died spiritually, that's when sin entered into them. And it became a part of them. Just as much as they were Adam, and just as much as they were Eve, they were also sin. Well, after God saves you, the scourging process is to show you, this is still in here. You can't get rid of it. Right? The word in cancer terminology is, it's metastasized. 
It's not just a little lump that we can remove as a tumor. It's spread all throughout. But we got to get rid of it. Well, Lord, how are you going to do that? we got to cut it out with what? The sharp two-edged sword of the Word of God. But I promise once it's gone, things are going to begin to get better. And God doesn't, although He could, demand that we be scourged all at once. What's He do? Piece by piece. He conforms us into the image of His Son. Because He knows that if He scourged us too much at once, it'd kill us. If He cut so much away from us that we had nothing left, there'd be nothing left to work with. Sometimes you've got to take out the small defects before you can move to the larger ones. Sometimes you've got to take a large one out and work on replacing it before you can get stable enough to move on to something else. He does all things well. I will not pretend to tell you today God's scourging process and all the intricacies thereof. Because I don't know. I just know what He's done in my life. Now I don't know how you need to be scourged, but I do know this, we all do. The choice is whether we'll do it willingly looking unto Jesus as He submitted to the will of the Father, or whether we'll go rebelliously and God has to chasten us before He can scourge us. But a true Christian understands that scourging is not enjoyable now, but because of the joy of righteousness that's set before us after the scourging, we embrace it willingly. Why? Because it's what God desires for us and because we desire to be more like His Son. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.